Book Five, Chapter Twenty Two, of A Hero of Our Time, by Mikhail Yurovich Lermontov, translated by Mar Murray and J. H. Wisdom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Chapter Twenty Two. Next morning, having received orders from the supreme authority to betake myself to the N fortress, I called upon Princess Ligovsky to say good-bye. She was surprised when, in answer to her question, whether I had not anything of special importance to tell her, I said I had come to wish her good-bye, and so on. But I must have a very serious talk with you. I sat down in silence. It was clear that she did not know how to begin. Her face grew livid. She tapped the table with her plump fingers at length. In a broken voice she said, "'Listen, Monsieur Pachorin, I think that you are a gentleman.' I bowed. "'Nay, I am sure of it,' she continued, "'although your behavior is somewhat equivocal. But you may have reasons which I do not know, and you must now confide them to me. You have protected my daughter from slander. You have fought a duel on her behalf. Consequently, you have risked your life. Do not answer. I know that you will not acknowledge it, because Gruznitsky has been killed.' she crossed herself. God forgive him, and you too, I hope. That does not concern me. I dare not condemn you, because my daughter, although innocently, has been the cause. She has told me everything, everything, I think. You have declared your love for her. She has admitted hers to you. Here Princess Ligovsky sighed heavily. But she is ill, and I am certain that it is no simple illness— Secret grief is killing her. She will not confess it, but I am convinced that you are the cause of it. Listen, you think, perhaps, that I am looking for rank or immense wealth. Be undeceived. My daughter's happiness is my sole desire. Your present position is unenviable, but it may be bettered. You have means. My daughter loves you. She has been brought up in such a way that she will make her husband a happy man. I am wealthy. She is my only child. Tell me, what is keeping you back? You see, I ought not to be saying all this to you, but I rely upon your heart, upon your honor. Remember, she is my only daughter, my only one. She burst into tears. Princess, I said, it is impossible for me to answer you. Allow me to speak to your daughter alone. Never, she exclaimed, rising from her chair in violent agitation. "'As you wish,' I answered, preparing to go away. She fell into thought, made a sign to me with her hand that I should wait a little, and left the room. Five minutes passed. My heart was beating violently, but my thoughts were tranquil, my head cool. However, assiduously, I sought in my breast for even a spark of love for the charming Mary. My efforts were of no avail. Then the door opened, and she entered. Heavens, how she had changed since I had last seen her, and that but a short time ago. When she reached the middle of the room, she staggered. I jumped up, gave her my arm, and led her to a chair. I stood facing her. We remained silent for a long time. Her large eyes, full of unalterable grief, seemed to be searching in mine for something resembling hope. Her wan lips vainly endeavored to smile. Her tender hands, which were folded upon her knees, were so thin and transparent that I pitied her. Princess, I said, you know that I have been making fun of you. You must despise me. A sickly flush suffused her cheeks. Consequently, I continued, you cannot love me. She turned her head away, leaned her elbows on the table, covered her eyes with her hand, and it seemed to me that she was on the point of tears. "'Oh, God!' she said almost inaudibly. The situation was growing intolerable. Another minute, and I should have fallen at her feet. "'You see yourself,' I said, in as firm a voice as I could command, and with a forced smile. "'You see yourself that I cannot marry you. Even if you wished it now, you would soon repent.' My conversation with your mother has compelled me to explain myself to you so frankly and so brutally. I hope that she is under a delusion. It will be easy for you to undeceive her. 
You see, I am playing a most pitiful and ugly role in your eyes, and I even admit it. That is the utmost I can do for your sake. However bad an opinion you may entertain of me, I submit to it. You see that I am base in your sight, am I not? Is it not true? Even if you have loved me, you would despise me from this moment? She turned round to me. She was pale as marble, but her eyes were sparkling wondrously. I hate you, she said. I thanked her, bowed respectfully, and left the room. An hour afterwards, a postal express was bearing me rapidly from Kislovodsk. A few versts from Esentuki, I recognized near the roadway the body of my spirited horse. The saddle had been taken off, no doubt, by a passing Cossack, and in its place two ravens were sitting on the horse's back. I sighed and turned away. And now, here in this wearisome fortress, I often ask myself, as my thoughts wander back to the past, why did I not wish to tread that way, thrown open by destiny, where soft joys and ease of soul were awaiting me? No, I could never have become habituated to such a fate. I am like a sailor, born and bred on the deck of a pirate brig. His soul has grown accustomed to storms and battles. But once let him be cast upon the shore, and he chafes, he pines away, however invitingly the shade groves allure, however brightly shines the peaceful sun. The live-long day he paces the sandy shore, hearkens to the monotonous murmur of the onrushing waves, and gazes into the misty distance. Lo, yonder, upon the pale line dividing the blue deep from the gray clouds, is there not glancing the longed-for sail, at first like the wing of sea-gull, but little by little severing itself from the foam of the billows, and with even course drawing nigh to the desert harbor. End of Book 5, Chapter 22 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com End of A Hero of Our Time by Mikhail Yurovich Lermontov Translated by Mar Murray and J. H. Wisdom